fascinated by mixture, or even by any creolized form that may have happened elsewhere, you're fascinated by identifying what is of a Portuguese genealogy that can be found, materialized, in a way of building a, a house, of wearing a, a dress, or cooking a food or something like that, or speaking a language sometimes. The other thing that is illogical and that doesn't make sense uh, is that uh, there, there is an incredible concern about language. It's usually the, the fetish of language that is uh, um, the main um, staple in this sort of discourses about Portuguese universality and how different we were from the British or the French or the Spanish and so on. And it's always language. It's, it's always a fascination about how language is present elsewhere. Now, the problem with, with this discourse about language is that it is not a discourse that values the diversity of forms of Portuguese. <coughs> On the contrary, it punishes them at the same time. It does not value any process of creolization. On the contrary, it looks at it with a you know, funny, almost scornful uh, look. And it always shows um, propriety of the language. This, the, the representation is that the Portuguese are the owners and the inventors of a language. They speak the right form. They speak the authorized form. And then there's all these bastard ways of speaking Portuguese, which are really funny to look at, and that are a fantastic example of how the Portuguese language expands into the world. But as soon as any Brazilian speaker, or Cape Verdean speaker, or Angolan speaker, utters any sort of claim about how Portuguese should be spoken, he's immediately censored. Okay? And it's, it's been obvious in debates about the spelling uh, agreement lately that what's at stake there is a, a wrong perception that the Portuguese language is being Brazilianized. That's really what, what's there when most people react against it. Um, so, this said, let me look briefly at the Brazilian case and then look more uh, in depth at the, the Cape Verdean case. In the case of Brazil, it's not really about creolization I want to talk about. It's a very short, short paragraph about language itself. And it's just a provocation that I'll set you. And then, about Cape Verde, it's really about how creolization can become a national discourse about identity and what happened there that is different from uh, other places when we think about creolization. Um, in the case of Brazil, uh, I'm not a linguist. I'm not even a, a linguistic anthropologist, OK? So from a very naive point of view, uh, one day I found myself asking, why wasn't Brazilian Portuguese considered a Creole? Right? Why wasn't it considered a Creole? Um, and actually, why didn't you know the Portuguese authorities with all this linguistic nationalism call it a Creole as a sort of uh, distinction mechanism? But mostly, in Brazil itself, why was it not considered a Creole? And I think that what we have to look at is the politics of language, of course. I mean, uh, you know, the, the popular, not popular, but po academic popular expression of, you know, a language is a dialect in an army, right? And, and this is really the case. I mean, a language is also a, a dialect with an elite behind it, right? And the process of the formation of, of the Brazilian nation state is really the handover, the handing over of power from a colonial administration to a local elite that is actually loser Brazilian at the beginning. That, I mean, the, the people who take power in Brazil who actually declare the independence and, and uh, occupy the structure of the pre-existing colonial state are not only, they were Portuguese one minute before in the sense that their identity was loser Brazilian, they were uh, people in Brazil that have the family and sociological connections to their uh, kinship networks uh, over the empire and centered in Portugal. That's the first thing. So they are what the Spaniards would call a Creole elite, but that was never used in Brazil. In Brazil, the term Creole was reserved to describe the black slaves who were born in Brazil. 
but this uh, elite, which was white and European and genealogically connected to, uh, to Portugal, was also a political elite in the sense that the independence of Brazil being uh, uh, an independence that led to the only monarchy in the Americas, you know, except to what happened in Mexico for a few years, but the only actual monarchy in the Americas was a very interesting case because it, had, it is actually a spin-off. and a, a, It's like an outshoot of the Portuguese monarchy and the Portuguese state itself. So what you really have is, is a state that continues you know, from pre-independence to independence, without an actual change in form and nature, you know, and it is just and it is occupied by the same people. It's basically the cousins that occupy it. Okay. And so the the centralizing and the centralized aspect of the Portuguese language as an administration language, as the language of the state, and as the language of the elites, you know, sort of congeals it as a state language that from an identity point of view is the language that the elites are empowered Brazil are speaking. And in that sense, it is Portuguese. It cannot be a Creole. It cannot be considered a Creole by any way. And when the Creolization process of the language starts, or it, it, had, it was starting already, it was happening already, but it was happening among the popular classes. And the huge divide of class, which is also a divide of race, and the divide of, of civil status, because what you have is free people and slaves, basically, uh, is actually what keeps separate the notion that you may have a state language, and that, that language can have a name that connects to the linguistic classifications of Europe, right? It's Portuguese that is being spoken, like it could be Norwegian or something else, but it, there's, there's a whole, uh, hierarchical and emotional aspect to it, you know, the importance of calling it um, Portuguese. And then what's being spoken in the streets is actually bad Portuguese, or is that because it is lower class Portuguese, because it's the, it's the Portuguese of the masses, of the illiterate people, and so on and so forth. So that's a class divide there. Going on. And so there is never the political opportunity for calling it a Creole because of the emotional and cultural and political meaning that calling something a Creole had. You know, that's something we need to, to also be careful about, that there's, there's something to it that, 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 uh, that um, stops and prevents a situation like the Brazilian one from calling it a Creole. In the same way that in other situations, there's a situation of power that allows it to be created because it's actually created from the top down. It's usually the colonial administrators, the missionaries, the old anthropologists, the linguists that define, hey, what you guys speaking is a Creole. Mm -hmm. And then in some situations, people can actually turn that around and, and, and make that an identity source. And that's what we see happening in many places. And that's what I'd like to talk about Cape Verde, because in Brazil that process did not happen. It did not happen at all. Um, and, it, and the very few attempts at that were also the typical attempts made by radicalized segments of a cultural elite that at a certain point in the history of Brazil mentioned the possibility of either calling it a Creole or but that was not usually the solution that they envisaged, or calling it a different language. It's the form of, of cultural nationalism of, of a different sort. And that happened for a few years in Sao Paulo around the, or what are they called? All the people talking about cannibalism and anthropophagy and so on. There, there was this, this, this cultural movement among artistic elites, you know, in a city that was economically growing like Sao Paulo and that had no emotional and cultural connection to Portugal as opposed to Rio de Janeiro, that there was this attempt at a certain point to say, well, we talk as a different language, so let's give it another name, let's start calling it Brazilian. But that's not realization, <laughs> that's nationalism by separation. And it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't effective anyway, it was sort of an artistic movement that, that did not um, have political consequences. And, uh, and so. Now, in the case of Cape Verde, which I also think challenges common notions about realization. Uh, 
I looked into it, like many people did, through the lens of lusotropicalism and of deconstructing lusotropicalism, of analyzing and criticizing Zubat Frey's theories. And um, when we look at Frey's history, the way that he built his big narrative about Brazil, and then he started looking at the Portuguese empire, and then he was appropriated by the Portuguese colonial regime. At this third stage, he's traveling around the Portuguese Empire of the time, the 1950s. And one of his stops in his journeys throughout the empire that were financed by the Minister of the Overseas, by the Portuguese Minister of the Overseas, who actually at a certain point had what at the time was a, a progressive idea about what these, uh, these ideas could mean, but, but the political situation didn't allow for that. You can be as progressive as you want, talking about universalism, talking about multiculturalism, avant la lettre, you know. I, I, as a kid, saw posters in Lisbon that showed uh, a black young man and a, a white young woman on a beach in Mozambique, and it was official propaganda, and it says, Portugal, a multicultural, multiracial state, and this was in 1969, you know, and so this was avant la lettre. But it can't be progressive if it's done by a dictatorship. You know? <laughs> so there's a fantastic contradiction going on here. Um, and that's why multicultural discourse was killed uh, together with the dictatorship. And the Portuguese state had to invent nowadays interculturality because it just cannot talk about the same thing. So one of Frey's stops in his journeys across the Portuguese empire was Cape Verde, the Cape Verde architect. Uh, there, he had become the guru of the local literary elite uh, who saw in lusotropicalism the explanation for Cape Verde's creoleness, that the word and the term existed there and was accepted and promoted. In fact, the members of the literary movement, named after the journal Claridad, notably Baltazar Lopes, and many people here are from literary studies and more about this than me, uh, they thought that Cape Verde was a better example than Brazil of the successes of Muslim tropical civilization. So what you have here is you have a, a literary elite in Edward that read Gilbert Freire, but said, hey, listen, what you're saying applies more here than it does in Brazil. So we're a very good example of your theory. Uh, Edwardians were in an in-between situation from, you know, in political and cultural terms. Officially, they were not classified as indigenous peoples by the Portuguese colonial regime but as Portuguese citizens, as opposed to Angolans, Guineans, or Mozambicans. Nevertheless, Cape Verde was, in name and in fact, a colony, not a region like the islands of the Zores of Madeira. So there's an in-between situation, even from a political and administrative point of view, which is, of course, a classifying anthropological point of view, too, from the state. Um, Authors in the Claridad's cultural movement developed, nevertheless, a notion of regionalism. You know, they saw Cape Verde as a regional variety of Portugal, as much as the North Atlantic Islands or any of the continental Portugal's provinces. So they did take seriously what the state was offering them and made that into a valuable uh, construction of identity. Uh, this, they claimed, was the result of miscegenation and creolization. It was, according to them, it was because of miscegenation and creolization that you could say that Cape Verde was a region of Portugal and not your typical African colony. So they were distinguishing themselves from the other classifications. Now, Gilberto Freire's writings on his visit to Cape Verde started a bitter polemic, since instead of confirming Claridad's ideas, Freire found Cape Verde to be too African. This is, this is a very funny story, many people have written about it, is that you know, you, you're there in the island, you belong to the literary elite of the, the capital, it was actually not the capital town, it was in Lille mostly, and, uh, and um, you, you know, you've read Gilbert Frey in the cafes, and you've written about him, and you've said that you are the best example, what you're saying, and the day he arrives, he gets there and he doesn't like it. And he doesn't like it because he thinks it's too African. That is, Gilbert Frey says, this is not realized enough. This is not mixed enough. There's something too African about this year. And this starts a huge polemic between the people in Claridad and Gilbert Frey himself. Creole language, 
And if you're talking about Pig Freud, which is one of the cases where an actual Creole language was developed, you know, next to something else. Creole language in particular was seen by the Brazilian scholar as a sign of Africanity, not as a sign of a complete synthesis of European and African cultural contributions. That was supposedly Brazil's achievement. So having a Creole language for a Brazilian sociologist of the time was an African sin, right? Because Brazil did not have such a thing, for the reasons I told you before. And so this is amazing for us, that the presence of a Creole is not a sign of the type of universal mixture that is praising so much, that is read as a sign of Africanity, which is very interesting to think about what does Creole mean in the anthropological imagination of the 19th and 20th century uh, imagination of language diversity and cultural diversity in a colonial and European expansion context. Um, according to Gabriel Fernandes, uh, who's a Brazilian uh, Cape Verdean anthropologist you know, with an education in Brazil, the literary elite in Cape Verde claimed for itself the role of mediator in the relations between the natives and the colonial power. Throughout the history of Cape Verde, this was achieved by means of shifting the border between dispossessed filhos da terra, sons of the land, sons or daughters of the land, and property-owning brancos da terra, wives of the land, to a broader opposing, to a border, sorry, opposing brancos da terra and brancos metropolitanos, that is from Portugal. Uh, <coughs> So, uh, and also between Cape Verdean civilized and African indigenous, between colonizer and colonized. So there's all these dividing lines that, that keep happening uh, in the Cape Verdean polity uh, that leads to the creation of a sector of the population that sees itself as closer to the colonizer and farther away from uh, Africa, so to speak. <coughs> And there were several crucial moments in this process. The first was the period between the Berlin Conference of 1884-85 and the Republican regime in Portugal, 1910-26. The foundation in, of a Catholic seminar in the late 19th century in the island of São Nicolau promoted the education of the elites and fostered the engagement of Cape Verdeans in the administration of the colony of Guinea-Bissau, which is right in front in the continent. Actually, in the intellectual milieu, uh, this was the period of uh, and another type of, of, of perspective, that of the nativists, whose claims to Portuguese citizenship went hand in hand with an appraisal of Africa, uh, this was on one side of the divide, and the Cape Verde motherland on the other. So you have a period when you, you start having an actual awareness of the construction of awareness of Africanity, but it is seen from the point of view of Cape Verdeans who are already sent by the colonial authorities to administer African colonies in the mainland. The second period goes from the beginning of the, the dictatorship in 26 up until 19, the 1960s. The period was marked by an investment in establishing differences between Africa and Cape Verde. Cape Verde was not Africa, as well as by the increasing participation of Cape Verdean elite members and civil servants in civilizing natives in mainland Africa. The people from Claridad focus on mestizage as an expression of the cultural Portugueseness of Cape Verde and on the archipelago as an instance of Portuguese regionalism. And the third period uh, after World War II was the era of stronger colonial presence in institutional work with, for instance, the creation of uh, a publication called the Bulletin Cap Verde, the Journal of Colonial Studies of the Archipelago. And it calls for the intervention of the local literary elite and the sending of specialists to study the island. Fernandes notes that colonial power had left for the local intellectuals the responsibility to prove being worthy of differential treatment and that it was now co-opting their production in order to avoid the temptations of independence. So there's like a, a trade-off here. On the one hand, there was the movement of claridad, and on the other, the youngsters of the Casa de Estudante do Império, which was like the place where in Lisbon, you know, the few people that came from the colonies to study in the university state, and this, this generation of students in Lisbon from the different colonies and the so-called generation of 50, of 1950, uh, they were very much influenced by international movements like the Ecritude and uh, a lot of authors, and they actually called for the re-Africanization of the minds, as they said. Uh, they were to become members of the independence movement for both Guinea and Cape Verde. Uh, 
as we see Sanji in Creolization, as well as Creole as a language, uh, were probably not part of their uh, uh, main uh, concerns. And um, if, if, if we look at how Creole language was formed in Cape Verde, we actually see that it is closely connected with uh, structural conditions of class and race uh, relations. You know, that's what Gabriel Fernandes does very well in his analysis. I'm not going into that, uh, uh, into the specifics, but we're not talking about the plantation society. That's the point. We're talking about uh, the fact that you create a local elite that becomes landowning in situations of not a plantation society, but the lack of it, you know, and the need to actually make the land productive in very harsh conditions, and this leads to the situation of the so-called whites of the land actually intermarrying with uh, African uh, uh, people who stay behind in the, the process of uh, being exported in the slave trade. And so you do, cre you do have the creation of a Creole uh, language, but the Creole language is part already of the creation of a social structure that divides between more African and less African. And so the Creole language follows something that is very typical in any context. It becomes the language of the home, the language of the street, the language of intimate and informal relations, while Portuguese stays as the language of the administration and the language of the literary elites. And in a way, you can see that happen today still. I mean, you do have the development of a national literature that talks about national motifs, but it is not written in Creole, it's written in Portuguese. Uh, you do have the attempts by the state to stabilize the Creole version, make it into a language, and it has been done, and to teach it and to actually make it co-official, and to actually use it in official documents, but when you look at it pragmatically, it really doesn't have that, strength, that type of strength. It, it remains as uh, at the bottom of a type of hierarchy, which always defines political purposes, administrative purposes, and scientific purposes as higher and whatever you talk in the kitchen, or at home, or on the street, or in a party, as lower, you know, closer to the bodily and interactive activities of people, and not to the intellectual and spiritual and administrative activities of governance. And that still happens uh, today, in spite of rhetoric about the co-officiality uh, of the language and so on. I don't think I have much time, so I'm going to jump forth a little bit. Um, so, uh, what, what I'm trying to, to provoke here is a discussion about uh, the allure that creolization has, has as a romantic, emancipatory, post-racial, post-national thing in the imagination of maybe uh, ourselves, you know, of uh, the more progressive uh, academics, uh, of uh, people who want to go beyond racial and national divides, people who are concerned with the cosmopolitan uh, nature of their societies and cities, people who want uh, to have policies that welcome immigrants and that go walk away from a, a nationalistic and racialized definition of nationality. I mean, and I think this is all great. <laughs> The problem is, we're doing it, many of us, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying us, but many people of this nature use Creoleness, and I think Thomas was very good at, at showing how many of these concepts get mixed. I read the miscegenation, Creolization, diversity. They are different, but they get mixed in the imagination of, of many people because they seem to be nice and to be the alternative to uh, purity and border keeping. However, the history of the idea of creolization is not necessarily like that. I mean, not only because of historical, economic, social reasons that we know, you know, plantation society is probably the most unfair system there ever was. That's one thing. The nature of it is, is, is not nice. But also because uh, it can become the simple definition of a national identity. And that's pretty much what I think happened in Cape Verde. In Cape Verde, it became the state's definition of what it is to be Cape Verdean. And so 
Cape Verde and Creoles are uh, interchangeable in the Cape Verdean imagination and in the way that Cape Verdean state talks about itself. Although when you know um, push comes to shove in certain situations, you make it very clear the distinction between using Portuguese and being proficient in it and showing that proficiency in diplomacy, in international relations, in that the, the exertion of the power of the state upon people, and you leave Creole for the cultural expressions of music and songs uh, as part of a cultural product that you sell in the international scene. Okay, so you can actually, even in, in, in very Creolized situations, you can still find the origin of the division, of the colonial division, that, you know, in spite of any mistake and that a whole community that presents itself as Creole, when certain situations call for it, you make a division between what is more Portuguese and what is more Creolized, and in Cape you actually make a third one, which is what is African, you know, what kinds of music and body movements and skin colors are African as opposed to Creole or to Portuguese, uh, but the hierarchy is there, so that the, the historical uh, hierarchization of language, culture, and race, you know, and the, the common metaphorical ground in which they circulate is still very much present, and um, in a way we can see that in the fact that, and in a way I go back to Thomas, if you look at European societies, and if you look at the progressive uh, sectors in culture and social sciences in European societies, what we do is we praise forms of mixture and creoleness, but we don't really like to use those terms to talk about ourselves. And uh, we, when we talk about ourselves, we like to talk about tolerance, integration, or cosmopolitanism, or citizenship for all, or color blindness, race blindness, cultural blindness, you know what I mean? But we don't talk about let's be Creole. We don't want to be Creole, and that's terrible. That's terrible in the sense that it means that we're still dividing uh, uh, things, and that's why we keep Creoleness at the level of cultural consumption, not at the level of cultural life. And cultural consumption is food and music and celebratory moves of integration of difference, but not uh, when it becomes uh, a threat to uh, the cultural borders that supposedly have to correspond to the borders of the state. Uh, and I'll, I'm, I must be totally... So let me just finish by coming back to Portugal, where uh, the imagination of the colonial experience of the expansion of the Portuguese state never really included the notion of Creoleness. I was very careful about it, I was very suspicious about it. There's a whole period of negation and militant struggle against anything that sounded like miscegenation or crossing or whatever, you know, by anthropologists, you know, physical anthropologists, by administrators and so on, followed by what I think was actually a revolution in perspective of lusotropicalism, that was a big change, but the fact that that change happened as a, resor a resource, a last minute resort to uh, uh, keep colonialism going when internationally it was being punished and, and becoming unacceptable, that sort of ruined everything. You know, all the potential of, uh, all the potential that Zubert Frey's ideas could eventually have, you know, was ruined by uh, that situation. Uh, but the fantasy of mixture outside Portugal goes on in the Portuguese imagination as a very uh, strong identitary uh, theme provided that that is something that happens in outer space. And by outer space, I really mean outer space. It's a space outside of Portugal, but it's also outer space. Here it's not supposed to happen. It's just not supposed to happen. And that's why uh, 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 what we have in, 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 in the, the discourse of the Portuguese state and its mechanisms of governance, ever since the revolution up until today, no matter whether the government is left-wing or right-wing, what you have is you have uh, um, 
an exaggerated color blindness, an exaggerated cultural blindness, you know, this is a way of saying we're very cosmopolitan and focusing on individual citizenship, and this is the French model, of course, which is incredibly exaggerated to the point of creating the total uh, occlusion of the social reality of coincidence between class, race, and neighborhood, and, and, and status and income level in this country, which is very clear and yet totally untalked about, and at the same time promoting uh, a policy of ethnic minority integration that is based on this concept of interculturality that I think should be explored by some PhD candidate in anthropology or comparative studies, because it's become the official rhetoric of the Portuguese state. And when we talk with them, and once I had the opportunity to talk with them, the president of the agency that, that leads with ethnic minorities happens to be an anthropologist. And, and she said, oh, because, you know, the ideal is that people are individual citizens. I said, yes, I think so too. I mean, that's a democratic, <laughs> uh, and at the same time, we have to refuse multiculturalism because it looks at cultures as these separate things and blah, blah, blah. So I said, yeah, so I agree with you. So why don't I like the rhetoric that you use? And she said, I don't know, because we're still constructing it, we're still building it. And so the idea of interculturality is actually that at the same time you, you, you have, yes, you do have separate cultures because we are the consequence of an historical process. It's not that you want them to be separate. Um, and, uh, but at the same time, you have to promote dialogue. You know, the official rhetoric is intercultural dialogue. That's the expression of the official rhetoric. The agency is called uh, High Commissioner for Ethnic Minorities and Intercultural Dialogue. Uh, so there's a problem here, and we, we as anthropologists, at least, I think we have an obligation to look into it because we've done such, you know, Thomas is an example, such great work about, you know, at the same time thinking about reality and deconstructing the concepts to use for understanding it, you know, like realization, plurals, diversity, agreement, institutionation. And now probably, you know, coming full circle back, you know, after 500 years of expansion of the Portuguese state, and now it's, it's incredible retraction, and we come back to this situation where we're talking about interculturality, and we probably should think about what it means and it doesn't. And reflections about pluralization are very good for it, because it's an historical way of classifying. And, um, and I think the two examples that are used here show how it can go in many different directions. Thank you. Did I talk too much? No, no, not at all. I think uh, just uh, 40, uh, 50 minutes is perfect. Uh, in any case, we're, um, uh, I'm pretty sure we have a lot of questions to this amazing talk. So thanks so much. Um, I, I will save my questions for the round table later on, also because then we can, of course, discuss about many topics, many more topics that have been uh, on the table this morning. Um, any questions right now for uh, Miguel? Um, uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so uh, basically, I was just wondering because you were talking about um, well the the interculturality in you know postmodern society with the left progressive you know uh, uh, ideas. And I was wondering, how would you relate this to uh, this idea of exotism of the 19th century romanticism? Do you think it's sort of like a more, well, you know, civilized, more sort of progressive form of still exotism? Like, you know, as long as it's music and dance and food or whatever, it's really great, but, you know, let's not get influenced by this. You know, do you think it's like the, you know, an extended influence of, of, of that idea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could, it could very, very well be, and um, that would be very nice to to do some research on that, you know, actually from people from cultural studies who could help anthropologists and vice versa, because then we could focus on uh, specific products that are consumed and that are deemed as worthy of, you know, praise and others that are not. And I, I always have this notion that, and Thomas said it too, you know, the problem is always with sex and reproduction and, and making people, you know. <laughs> you know, that's, that's where the line is usually drawn, because even although that can be overcome too, in the sense that um, certain certain things can be consumed or can be accepted as part of this uh, staging of interculturality, you know, and it's usually performative uh, bodily 
sensorial uh, types of things, which is funny, right? Um, but the limit is probably actually, we, we should not just look at reproduction, but probably also at the level of high culture, as, as in the 19th century we used to say. And that's language. And, and language is such an important, it's so important there. Language slash, slash literature uh, slash, you know, um, state governance. You know, that's where you sort of put the limit, you know, and, and, and you keep detached. I, that really needs to be ethnographed and studied because this is the sort of thing that we have an impression. I have the impression that this is obvious in Portugal and in many other countries, that it's always happening, and yet we need to prove and show how and where it happens. Yeah. Yeah. I just thought to bring in an example which goes in this, in the direction of your your reflections and the importance of considering the the ideology so if I agree with you or their limits and it's something I've been working on right now and it's about this uh, this patrolling of the mixed marriages in Europe and the suspicion of instrumentality where there you have this idea that you you're not supposed to mix uh, interest and, and love for example so which, which I find that in tourist context it still can be accepted by tourists, for example, but then when you want to bring this home, that there is a very strong boundary there, and uh, this discourse all of a sudden can be completely disrupted, I mean, because that's when you get exactly to, to sex reproduction, to this fear which is kind of untouchable in a way, or creates even more controversy. So yeah, I, I really like the, this, this drawing attention to the, the history and politics and ideologies of pluralization mm -hmm. and these things. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and, and I think that, that we should also look at, um, at how certain uh, segments of the population are not um, looked into with the same frame. You know, like realization. Uh, whereas, you know, if you look at the processes, they could very well be looked at with those lenses. You know, uh, when Thomas was talking about, you know, you know, uh, super diversity. You know, it's it's true because the same thing happens here and it happens everywhere. You know, the fact that you get uh, certain parts of of the metropolitan area of Lisbon and in certain generations. You get the creation of forms of um, body language, dress, language codification. You get a lot of stuff going on in, in, in the areas where you have an overlap of immigrant population and descendants of immigrants and Portuguese uh, population or whatever. And you get this process is happening. I mean, any high school teacher can talks about this every day about what happens in class. You know, about linguistic changes that are very profound. This morning on Facebook someone was talking about that, about how the 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 you in Portuguese just disappeared, you know, and everyone is using ill after, you know, the verb. Um, but we don't call this realization. And are are we are very we're afraid of it or we're suspicious of it and probably um, because of, of one reason I think it's, it's fundamental, I think it's, that's why it's important to define concepts and if you want to look at it in a very historical and social economic specific situation, foundation society, blah, 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 okay. Then you have a framework and you, you restrict it to that framework and you can't use the expression to talk about other contexts. That's fine. But once when people themselves use the word to describe what they're doing and that's what happens in places like the word and so on, um, or what if someone uh, starts using it in a creative way? I mean, what if suddenly those kids start using it? And that has happened already. And that has happened with, uh, with cer certain uh, cultural uh, situations where, um, um, for instance, Cape Verde Creole is being used by African descendants that are not from Cape Verde. So it becomes the language of the Portuguese blacks, you know, in certain social situations, uh, for instance. And that's that's an interesting thing to look into. Huh? Uh, 
And I'm sure there's someone in the Bible literature done work on that already, because that, that was very obvious at a certain point in the last 20, 25 years. You know, that you will find in Creole, especially in song, being used by, you know, what you define as a black person, and then you would interview the, the black person, and the black person was from Angola, from Mozambique, or his parents mm -hmm. were, you know. And the, the language being used, the, the code that was being used for that specific social, cultural statement of singing, you know, for instance, a hip hop song was uh, Creole, but Creole was came from Cape Verde. It wasn't from Cape Verde, no, it was from Portugal, from this, the neighborhood where these people are, you know, building their lives. And so this, these are all interesting processes that we should look into it and criticize the concepts that we use. Yeah. Yeah, well, th thanks very much, Mia. I mean, a, a very, very interesting uh, talk, and uh, it makes us a lot, gives us a lot to discuss. And I'd just like to, to uh, ask you about one thing to do with hierarchy, <coughs> because I think you, you made a, sort of, you made a good case for showing how one can talk about creolization and um, somehow reproduce existing power structures in, in very different ways. I mean, here you uh, reject or you refuse the fact that you are being creolized, as it were, that things are being coming from outside and influencing your, your culture. Maybe it's because it's a sign of weakness. Maybe it's because the imperial power shouldn't be influenced, you know, by the previously colonized peoples. But I'm thinking about some other examples as well, and I'd like to hear your take on the debate in Brazil about uh, uh, Brazilian national identity being less sort of racist and more colorblind. You know, when I was in Brazil, I mean, I said, look, I mean, you can, everybody can tell that there's race here as well because the elites are mostly white and the popular are mostly black. And then my, my interpreters there, or the people who took me around, said that, but look, I mean, in this favela, most of the people who live there are white, you see, so, uh, so we're not racist, you know, uh, and that sort of discourse. And it reminded me a bit of a discourse today, having made Mexico around Misty Sacher. Um, yeah. You know, you discuss that in the written version, the written longer version of your paper, the uh, Misty Sauer, or the, you know, yeah. the Portuguese take yeah. of Misty Sacher. How the Mexican elites have used the concept of Misty Sacher very consciously in order to weaken identity or rights claims from, from minorities, especially Native Americans, because we're all mixed. So who are you to talk about racism? I mean, there are no boundaries here. We're all so mixed, you know, and that's the, the, that's the identity of our, of our people, which resembles somehow the rhetoric in Brazil. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You're perfectly right. And what happened in Brazil is that in the last 10 years, there was a huge change, 10 to 15 years. Uh, it wasn't a change in the hegemonic way of looking at itself. Well, that continues to be very little tropical. It's very based on the idea that there's no racism, that there's a huge mixture. Yeah. And of course, there's a, it's hegemonic because you usually find that it's course actually coming from the bottom up, in a way, uh, uh, which is what happened to you when people tell you, you know, most people in this world are white and so mm -hmm. But a new thing happened in the last 10 to 15 years, which was the emergence of a black identity movement, mm -hmm. and then a change in the academia, especially in the social sciences, with all the, criti the critique of the national discourse mm -hmm. on miscegenation. It actually became a dividing, a huge dividing line was open in Brazilian society and in the academia. You know, and now you have these two opposing views. But the problem is that they continue to be, I mean, in order to oppose the Freudian perspective of Brazil, the black movement and some academics had to import the North American model. Exactly. And that's that's a problem because it's, you continue to have this. So it's a continuation of sort of an imperial discussion. Now, the thing is that the, the, the discussion became more sophisticated in the academy because the, the very violent and very strong opposition between two camps in, in academia, especially in anthropology, that is very important in Brazil, not like in Portugal. It's a very important social science with a lot of influence. Um, the dividing line is not between some conservative Freudian view and, this, uh, and some very progressive uh, uh, pro-black rights view. No, it's much more subtle than that. You have people who have been harsh critics of Roberto Frey's ideas and of the national ideology in Brazil, people like Peter Frey, our colleague, mm -hmm. but who refuse to go along the university quotas rationale for blacks and said that that would lead us into a North American situation and not into the ideal equal citizenship situation. Mm -hmm. And I'm not defending Gilberto Freire by saying this, so this is a more sophisticated position. 
And on the other side, some of the people who are in favor of the university quotas, they were saying, no, 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 this is not a North American import. We actually want the quotas to be not just by race, by self-definition of race, but we want it to be by um, outside definition of poverty. You know, we want the two things to go together. And so it became actually more sophisticated as a debate, and it's, it's changing. It's really changing the way that Brazil sees itself. And part of what we see going on now is a, an identity crisis in a good sense of the term, you know. It's actually a reconfiguration of uh, what the hell is going on in terms of class in this country, you know. Mm -hmm. Which, uh, when people talk about class, they're talking directly about it. Mm -hmm. In many contexts, they talk about race and ethnicity. Here, too, we just don't mention it, you know. It's, yeah. Class divisions in Portugal are perfectly racial in a very broad sense of the word racial. I mean, people identify the class they belong to by things like body type, the skin tone, hair color, and stuff, and eye color, and stuff like that. And this is, this is a hidden secret in Portugal, how you can actually, it's not that you can tell, it's that, that some bodies, some bodies are better for defining uh, the belonging to a certain class. Okay? And some bodies are more ambiguous. Okay? And some bodies are clearly lower class. And this has to do with performance, body performance, and corporality, but it also has to do with what would be phenotypical markers. Okay? That, that there are some excellent bodies for representing belonging to the upper to the upper classes. And those are blonde bodies and lighter skin bodies and, and bodies with foreign uh, blood, right? And the darker you become, and, 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 and the less uh, portly in the use of your body you become, the more clearly you are representative of the lower class. And this is taboo to talk about. People feel very embarrassed to talk about this. And yet, it's being reproduced constantly on the magazine covers and on you know, the gossip magazines and everywhere. And in interaction, you know, it's very clear in, 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 in interaction. So, there's also these other ways of looking into, you know, hierarchy and, uh, and um, that are much more anthropological and that are very difficult to change so sociologically. I mean, in social interaction, they're very difficult to change. Yeah, right. And in Brazil, something like that is happening. So you can have this discussion and this uh, 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 evolution <laughs> in the paradigm that <coughs> classify people racially. And yet, you know, when, when you come to direct social interaction, the categories come up very easily. You can really tell who's apt to represent what social class, and that usually has a racial content. Yes. Okay, very last, very short question, then we have uh, time for lunch, and then uh, uh, Yes, that was a question. I just wanted to add to what you were saying about the corporality of the class. Here in Portugal, you said the same, because the language plays a role in that as well. Oh, yeah. yeah. Because you walk out the street, you walk in the hallway, you're going to hear oh. different Portuguese spoken by different people of different classes, both in Portugal and in Brazil. There's no awareness of that. <coughs> you can talk about that more carefully. Yeah. How, what I'd say, probably someone else. Oh, yeah. Well, I think that's universal, social life and so on, but, but yeah, but, but there's... It's very much in Portuguese speaking world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, is there um, I'm fascinated, uh, Miguel, by the specific material on, on Cape Verde. By contrast with, this is not to open the discussion too much, I'm reminded of the Asian Creole communities that was a linguistic had been studying for a long time. But the, the, the case is really interesting to compare because it's completely different. I'm studying a very small minority in Malacca who speaks their Creole language, has Creole music, has Creole food, mm -hmm. and they don't use the word Creole ever. Uh -huh. Only a few people who are middle class or outside the, the neighborhood use it, and the linguists use it, I use it, but people don't use it in their yeah. language. They use the word mixed. Yeah. But, but it's fascinating because it, there's no elite, as in the case of Cape Verde, but they yeah. speak the language, they use it for tourism, the, the country later uses them as a tourist, uh, as a tourist uh, object and a source of income. And it's very interesting that the contest is absolutely radical. It's like a yeah. point. There's an, yeah. very yeah. 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 but you maybe rethink it a bit in your analysis. The second point is, when you were speaking about Rio and the 18th century, um, I've been reading recently a number of historians on the Asian Creole communities, and we 
months, a number of students, Sanjay, etc. And some of these uh, some of these people are reworking the notion of empire, and they destroy the notion that there was a Portuguese empire. In yeah. the century. It was a network of ports, yeah. a sloppy, very sloppy, for example, and it seems lines. to go very well, very closely to your notion of what we're yeah. doing here. Am I wrong or? Oh, you're absolutely right, and, and, and I'm, you know, I'm not the right person to talk about it because in our, in, when we did the whole project on colonial traffics and transits, we were actually using uh, frameworks, theoretical and interpretive frameworks from Brazilian historians, you know, of uh, the Atlantic trade, um, and, and that's pretty much what we said, you know, the fact that you actually, at, at, at a certain point, at certain moments, and for certain uh, social and economic relations, the center was real, for others was Lisbon or Goa at certain points, and, and, and things would shift uh, horizontally. And that has to do with uh, the, the whole weakness of the center. You know, like, uh, that was our theorization was about the weakness of the center, um, which was a very tricky thing to say because it sounds almost like a justifying excuse for a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. But the first thing you said was very interesting because uh, also because Maybe it has to do, you, you know, maybe about it. the way that, I mean, states, the state is such an important category for anthropological thinking nowadays, I think, you know. And, and I think some of those colonial states, like Malaysia, they build themselves on the notion of a very well-defined belonging to a cultural, linguistic, and religious community and how they organize yeah, exactly. It's official multiculturalism in that sense. And so that may have also a huge effect on how then uh, certain populations define themselves because they have to define according to the paradigm that the state offers and pushes on them, right? right. And, um, and, 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 and that's, I think, where a huge part of the differences come from. Although, of course, the state is not a bunch of people deciding things around the table. It's itself the result of an historical process, and there we can, we can feed in information about how it was built in a different way. But uh, that, that could probably be one of the, one of a good line of explanation. Yeah.